this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. Today I'll be presenting on a journal article titled The Safety and Efficacy of Tenecteplase Compared with Alteplase in Patients with Large Vessel Occlusion Stroke. So for our objectives today, we will review the use of thrombolytics in acute ischemic stroke with large vessel occlusion, and we will also evaluate this pre-specified analysis of the ACT trial comparing tenecteplase and alteplase for acute ischemic stroke. So we'll start with some brief background. As we know, the standard of care for acute ischemic stroke within four and a half hours of symptom onset is IV thrombolytic therapy with or without endovascular therapy. And our mechanical thrombectomy has proven benefit in functional outcomes at 90 days when compared to medical therapy alone. We also know that there's better functional outcomes when we combine both IV thrombolytic therapy with thrombectomy, um, but however, this does have an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And lastly, there is current literature that does support IV tenecteplase is as safe and effective um, as IV alteplase. However, there is a lack of evidence supporting if one agent is preferred over another, specifically in large vessel occlusions. On this slide, I just have highlighted the 2019 AHA ASA guidelines for the management of acute ischemic stroke. As you can see, alteplase is the recommended agent um, within four and a half hours of symptom onset. However, the guidelines do mention that it is reasonable to choose tenecteplase at a dose of 0.25 milligrams per kilograms over alteplase in patients who are also eligible to undergo mechanical thrombectomy. So to quickly review our thrombolytic agents, they work by binding to fi fibrin in the thrombus itself, and this helps facilitate the conversion of plasmidogen to plasmin and break down the clot. There are some subtle di or some differences between our two agents of tenecteplase and alteplase, one being the half-life. So the half-life of tenecteplase is significantly longer, and this does allow us to give tenecteplase as a bolus dose over five seconds compared to alteplase, which is a bolus followed by an infusion over one hour. Tenecteplase also has greater specificity to fibrin, and there is a higher resistance from plasmin, plasminogen activator um, inhibitors with tenecteplase. However, our alteplase agent does hold the FDA approval for acute ischemic stroke. I just wanted to quickly review some of the measurable, measurable outcomes that they look at in acute ischemic stroke studies. So starting with our National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale, or the NIHSS score, which measures stroke severity, as you can see, a lower score of less than five means that there's no symptoms or there's very minor symptoms of stroke with higher numbers correlating with severe stroke symptoms. We also have a modified Rankin score that looks at degree of neurological disability, which ranges from zero to no residual symptoms and six being neurological death, essentially. And there's also some reperfusion and recanalization outcomes that are mentioned in some of the studies. So first is the expanded thrombolysis in cerebral infarction, or the ETKI score, which measures reperfusion grade. And this score ranges from zero to three, zero indicating that there is no reperfusion and three being complete reperfusion. And then similarly, there is the revised arterial occlusion scale, or the RAOL scale, that looks at recanalization of intracranial occlusions. This score also is from zero to three, with three being complete recanalization of that thrombus. And just to note, most of the trials do aim for an ETKI or an RAOL score of 2B to 3. So now we'll talk about some current literature of acute ischemic stroke that compares tenecteplase to alteplase. So the first study I have is a NORTEST-1 trial that looked at 0.4 milligrams per kilograms of tenecteplase compared to standard doses of alteplase with or without mechanical thrombectomy. These patients did not have severe stroke and about 20% had a large vessel occlusion. Their primary outcome was a modified Rankin score of 0 to 1 at 90 days, and you can see that there was no difference found between our tenecteplase and alteplase groups, in addition to similar rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. The second study I've, I have highlighted here is the EXTEND-1A TNK trial, 
that looked at 0.25 milligrams per kilogram of tenecteplase compared to standard doses of altaplase. And this was in patients who all were undergoing mechanical thrombectomy and had a large vessel occlusion. As you can see, the primary outcome was reperfusion of greater than 50%, or if there was an absence of a retrievable thrombus. And they did find that tenecteplase was better than altaplase in this study in regard to the primary outcome, with similar rates uh, with uh, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And then the last study I have highlighted is the NORTES-2A trial, which looked at the higher dose of tenecteplase in patients with more moderate to severe acute ischemic stroke. About 57% of these patients had a large vessel occlusion. And when they looked at their primary outcome of modified Rankin score of 0 to 1 at 90 days, they found worse outcomes in our tenecteplase group. And they also found higher rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which actually led to this study being terminated early. I also have a few trials or studies looking at tenecteplase versus altaplase in large vessel occlusion. So the first is a retrospective observational study that looked at 0.25 mg per kg of tenecteplase or to altaplase. Most of these patients had a median modified Rankin score of 5 when they were admitted. And this study looked at pre-thrombectomy recanalization rates in which they found better outcomes with tenecteplase compared to altaplase, in addition to more re- um, successful reperfusion and better discharge modified Rankin scores with similar rates of intracranial hemorrhage between the two groups. And lastly, there's a systematic review or, and meta-analysis of four trials that looked at large vessel occlusion. Three of these trials had the lower dose of tenecteplase, um, and then one of the trials had the 0.4 mg per kg dosing of tenecteplase. Looking at an odds ratio, you can see that the modified Rankin scores at three months were better with tenecteplase in addition to better rates of successful recanalization. There was no difference when looking at intracranial hemorrhage rates in this study. And lastly, I wanted to highlight the ACT trial. So this is what the article I'm going to be evaluating actually did a pre-specified analysis on. So the ACT trial was an open-label registry-linked randomized non-inferiority trial that had blinded outcomes, and it was conducted at both primary and comprehensive stroke centers. Patients were included if they had a disabling ischemic stroke within four and a half hours of symptom onset, and about 25% of these patients had a large vessel occlusion. They looked at tenecteplase 0.25 milligrams per kilogram compared to standard altaplase dosing, And their primary outcome was functional outcomes defined as a modified Rankin score of 0 to 1 at 90 days, in which they didn't find any difference between our two groups, with similar rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage between altaplase and tenecteplase, and also similar mortality rates at 90 days. And about 32 to 33 percent of these patients underwent thrombectomy. So in conclusion, this ACT trial did find that tenecteplase was non-inferior to altaplase when looking at uh, functional outcomes. So now we will dive into reviewing the article that I'm going to be assessing today, which I mentioned is a pre-specified analysis of the ACT trial. So as I mentioned previously, this is a pre-specified analysis, but we were specifically looking at patients with large vessel occlusion, um, and it was with a 0.25 milligrams per kilogram of tenecteplase compared to altaplase. They included patients that were 18 and older with acute ischemic stroke within four and a half hours of symptom onset. All patients had a large vessel occlusion, as listed here, and patients were excluded if they had any contraindications to IV thrombolytic therapy. This is a breakdown of the study population. So for the ACT trial, there was 1,577 patients included. Of those, 520 had a large vessel occlusion. So that is our study population for this pre-specified analysis. You can see that there's an even distribution between patients who received tenecteplase and altaplase, and not all patients in this study did undergo a thrombectomy. For statistical analysis of this pre-specified analysis, they did use a Fisher exact test for categorical data and a Wilcoxon rink sum test for continuous data. There was multiple adjusted analyses based on what type of data they were analyzing, and there was an adjusted risk ratio and adjusted common odds ratio used to determine the estimates of the effect size based on these analyses. And a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered significant. 
For the primary outcome, they looked at a modified ranking score of 0 to 1 at 90 days, and they also assessed multiple secondary outcomes, including a modified ranking score of 0 to 2, any change in modified ranking score, a return to baseline function, any hospital length of stay, the use of thrombectomy, and also successful recanalization and reperfusion. 90-day all-cause mortality was also assessed in addition to symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. So now we'll move on to the results. Highlighting the baseline characteristics, most patients in this study were about 73 to 74 years old, and majority of the patients were female, with a baseline NIHSS score of 17. 94% of the patients did go to a comprehensive stroke center, and 78% did undergo thrombectomy. When looking at the location of the patient's large vessel occlusion, you can see there was no difference between our two study groups. Most patients had a M1 MCA um, occlusion. For our primary outcome of modified Rankin score of 0 to 1 at 90 days, you can see that there was a trend of better outcomes with tenecteplase with 32.7% compared to 29.6% with alteplase, but this was not found to be significant. And there's a further breakdown here on the bottom looking at the actual modified Rankin scores. And there was more patients in the tenecteplase group that had a modified Rankin score of 0 compared to our alteplase group. For some secondary clinical outcomes, so there was no difference between our tenecteplase and alteplase regarding modified Rankin score of 0 to 2, their actual modified Rankin score, and also return to baseline function. Also, no difference in hospital length of stay or any death at 90 days. For symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, there was a trend of higher bleeding in the tenecteplase group with 6.1% compared to 4.3% in alteplase, but this was also not uh, significant. And there were similar rates of intracranial hemorrhage identified on imaging between the two groups. They also did look at these outcomes based off of patients' location of LVO, and they did not find any differences. For procedural outcomes, so looking at recanalization first with our, our AOL score, You can see that there was a slight trend of better outcomes to nectoplase. However, this was not significant. And then also for reperfusion, there were similar rates between to nectoplase and alteplase. And no difference was noted when looking at um, patients' actual location of LVO for these outcomes as well. So this slide highlights the author's main discussion and conclusion points. So they noted that there was a higher trend of recanalization with to nectoplase, but similar reperfusion rates with alteplase. They also mentioned a shorter time from thrombolysis to reperfusion compared to some other studies. So specifically, they mentioned it took about 53 minutes um, for this time frame in this study compared to about 76 based off our, our extend 1A studies. They also found a trend of better 90-day functional outcomes with tenecteplase with similar rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And they did note that there was a limit population of a primary stroke center within this study. So in conclusion, the author noted that tenecteplase has similar reperfusion safety and functional outcomes when compared to alteplase, and they do support this as a first choice thrombolytic in patients with LVO when using uh, tenecteplase. I just wanted to put some own of my own personal critique in here as well. So I think it was a strength that they did use a pre-specified analysis, meaning that they were planning on conducting this analysis in large vessel occlusion before they completed the original study. And this is the largest sample size that I saw of any patients comparing tenecteplase and alteplase in large vessel occlusions. It also was a strength that they looked at the differences in Oak location for their large vessel occlusion, just to see if we did find any differences, which we did not in this study. And then lastly, they did use appropriate statistics and regression analysis, analyze their data. Some weaknesses was that the entire population did not undergo thrombectomy. And as we know, for any patient with a large vessel occlusion, it is first line therapy or standard of therapy to have these patients go undergo thrombectomy um, if possible. They also did not include a lot of patients at a primary stroke center. So 94% of patients were at a comprehensive stroke center. So considering that the patients, these patients were able to get back to me at their, you know, same institution, it possibly could have affected our results. 
And then lastly, there was no noting of any baseline characteristics within this study. Um, so specifically for like modified Rankin score, I'm unsure of what the patient's baseline were. So that would have been helpful to know. So some key takeaways from this pre-specified analysis is that it does display evidence supporting tenecteplase in large vessel occlusion stroke, um, and this may be as effective and safe compared to alteplase. However, I do think that further controlled studies are warranted to further evaluate the use of tenecteplase in large vessel occlusions. And that completes my presentation. I'd love to answer any questions you may have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.